This is our third week studying through the Old Testament prophetic book, this little small four-chapter book titled after one of its main characters, the prophet Jonah. If you're familiar with the story, you know that God told Jonah to arise, to go, and to preach in a place called Nineveh, but he didn't want to. Instead, he ran from God, he rebelled, and so God sent a storm that threatened to tear the ship apart, and at the end of it, Jonah knew that the only way that the ship and its sailors could be saved is if he either obeyed God or was some, in some other way was no longer rebellious towards God, and Jonah decided he'd rather die than obey God. So he told the sailors, throw me overboard, and God will have no quarrel with you. And we ended there last week. Last week, we stopped at the end of chapter 1, and we left Jonah in the water. God had hurled this storm across the sea. They had hurled him into the sea. Everything is calm. We wrapped up last week, if you look at the end of chapter 1, in verse 16, that these pagan sailors feared the Lord exceedingly. They used to be scared of the storm, but now they fear the God of the storm. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And we stopped there. Meanwhile, what about Jonah? We see how this whole chain of events has affected the sailors. But what about this rebellious prophet? Well, we left him in the water, but this is not the end of Jonah's life. I'm going to pick up in verse 17 of chapter 1, which in the Hebrew text is actually verse 1 of chapter 2. So we'll follow that breakup in our sermon this morning. So... Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, says this, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep. Into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet... You brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Lord, as we open your word this morning, we are in need to see your power, to see your grace, and to see a reflection of our own sin and our own need for repentance. I pray that as we think about this, uh, what is for many a familiar story, that it would be fresh, that you would confront the unbelief in our hearts, that you would awaken us from our spiritual slumber and draw us to yourself that you would bring about the change in our hearts that you desire through the power of your spirit and for the sake of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text this morning starts and ends with a reference to this great fish. You see it at the end of chapter 1 and at the end of chapter 2. The sovereign God who had hurled the storm also, we are told here, appointed a fish. And this creature is to come and rescue Jonah. So think about the fish as rescue, not as as more punishment or more discipline. Once again, we see here the sovereign authority of God over his creation. It's on display. When God tells a storm to exist, it does. When God appoints a fish to swallow up a rebellious prophet, it obeys. The dark ocean and its creatures had been symbols of chaos and untamed power in the ancient world. People feared the sea, and they feared the large creatures in the sea. But we see that the ocean, the weather, and even this great fish does the bidding of their maker. We're reminded here of Psalm 104, starting in verse 24. The psalmist writes, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea 
great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. God is the maker of the sea and everything that is in it, and he rules over it. Job 41 recounts for us how the massive beasts of the ocean can be formidable foes for mere humans. God asks Job, you think you can put a hook in that thing's mouth and make it go where you want? Can you put a leash on it and treat it like a pet? But these things are small and and submitted to the power of God. This fish, unlike Jonah, obeyed its maker, and it swallows him whole, not to punish him, but to rescue him from certain death, to preserve his life, giving him a chance to consider his ways. Alistair Begg comments on this fish, it's not a great place to live, but a wonderful place to learn. And he's right, these three days and three nights in the belly of this beast would be a time of reflection for Jonah. Later, this fish would burp him up on the shore when God told him to. It's at the end of chapter 2. Vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And these two mentions of this fish, this mysterious creature, really forms the bookends for what takes up the bulk of our text this morning, this poetic prayer. It's really a psalm uh, that Jonah prays to the Lord. You know, throughout the years, the, the detail of the fish usually gets more attention than Jonah's prayer. I think this fish has fascinated people more than anything else in this little book. And in order to defend the truthfulness of Scripture and the truthfulness of this story in particular, you know, there's a lot of interesting things we could say to explain how this could happen. You know, we could talk about different marine creatures that might have a mouth big enough to swallow a full-grown man. We might talk about different explanations that that show plausibly how Jonah could have survived and, and had air to breathe. There's all sorts of questions like that. And there's a time and a place to have those discussions. But the Bible gives us very little detail about that kind of stuff, as interested as we might be, as curious as we might be. It's interesting in the Hebrew text, the two words that are translated in the ESV as a great fish literally mean a great fish. It's just this generic description of a large critter that's swimming in the ocean. It's not intended to be a scientific label, so Jonah's not referring specifically to a cold-blooded vertebrate that uses gills to breathe underwater, as opposed to a marine mammal like a whale or something else. It might have been technically a fish. Maybe it was a large marine mammal. Or perhaps it was some creature that's now extinct that we don't even know about. We don't know. But that really doesn't matter. To jump too deep into those details, as interesting as it is, would be to miss the point, really, of this text. This is simply to be understood as a miracle that's been performed by God. And if we're okay with God speaking the world into existence and raising his son from the dead, we probably don't have a problem either with a fish swallowing a man for a couple days. So we can accept this is true. But what matters here is this power of God, the miraculous nature of it. What matters is not the fish, but the maker of the fish, not the creature but it's creator. And that should cause us to ask the question, what is God doing here? Why does he send this fish to swallow Jonah? What is God doing? Well, the answer is God is doing a whole lot. The miracle to behold in Jonah is not only God's work of sovereign power in the dark depths of the sea, but also God's work of sovereign grace in the dark depths of Jonah's heart. That's really what's going on in Jonah chapter 2. And that's why this prayer has been preserved for us. That's why the focus this morning is not going to be on the fish, but on the prayer that is offered from the belly of the fish. Remember where we are. Jonah had run from God, but God had pursued his rebellious servant and disciplined him. And, And then had rescued him. This fish had swallowed him to preserve his life. And now God is bringing Jonah to his senses. We talked last week about the delusion of disobedience. To think we can run from God, to think we can hide from God is spiritual insanity. And God is graciously getting Jonah's attention. He's in the belly for three days and nights, alone with his thoughts. And there, from that place of discipline, Jonah prays. A psalm of praise and thanks to God for being so merciful to him. As we read this text, maybe you noticed it as we were reading it earlier, you can tell Jonah is a man well acquainted with the scriptures. There's so many echoes and parallels to the Psalms in Jonah's prayer. 
We don't have time to list them all today, but some critical scholars have even assumed that this must be plagiarism. Somebody patched it together from the Psalms because there's so many references to that book of the Bible. But I don't think Jonah's plagiarizing, and I don't think that this somehow doesn't belong. Really what this demonstrates is that a heart that is bent towards God, as Jonah's has become, will be shaped by God's word. And so as Jonah prays, the things he knows to say to God are the things that he knows God has said in his word. And it saturates his prayer. Structurally, if you look at this this prayer, there's three parts to it. In verse 2, we see basically a summary of events. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. That's the summary of what happened. Jonah is in the water. He cries out to God for mercy, and God hears, and God answers. That's a summary of what he has just experienced there in the stormy seas. In verses 3 through 7, Jonah goes into more detail and unpacks what happens in poetic and vivid description, giving us the play-by-play and zooming in on exactly what he was feeling, what he was experiencing, and how God answered. Then in verses 8 through 9 comes a personal and theological conclusion. As Jonah declares the theological center of this book, salvation belongs to the Lord. This prayer, is, is we're going to make some observations on it this morning, it expresses something that is indispensable to the life of every single believer, you and me. And that's repentance. From this psalm, we discover three aspects of true repentance that I want to share with you this morning. We won't necessarily, as we usually do, walk through every single line and explain every term, but I want to, as we've already read it, make several observations that I think will be helpful for us. And the first is this, repentance. True repentance, biblical repentance, is turning to God. Repentance is turning to God. This is really at the heart and the essence of repentance. It's turning to God. And this turning is played out for us by the actual direction of Jonah's life. If you remember, remember back in chapter 1, Jonah, if you look back at it in verse 3, it says he rises to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. There's a direction here. He's going away from God. It says he goes down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, the opposite direction of Nineveh where he was supposed to go. It was the farthest outpost on the map. And he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish and again emphasizes away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah has been trying to run, trying to hide, trying to get as far as he can away from God. But instead of ending up in Tarshish, he's now sinking in the sea. And there's been this downward journey. He goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the hold of the ship. And he ends up going down into the water. As many have said before, sin always takes you farther than you want to go. And that's what Jonah has experienced. Away from God, sinking down into the water. His whole life, this whole story, is is such a picturesque metaphor for what it looks like when you and I turn away from God and pursue our sin. Jonah describes himself, if you jump back into chapter 2, he finds himself, after turning away from God, running away from God, he describes himself as being in the belly of Sheol. He says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. He says that he's in distress. Sheol is the place of the dead. He describes himself as being, in verse 3, in the heart of the sea. He describes himself in verse 4 as being driven away from God's sight. And he, here's what, we, what, what stands out about this. When he says, I'm driven away from your sight, Jonah's starting to wake up. And he's starting to realize he's becoming more and more aware of his spiritual danger, not just his physical danger. At first he's concerned that he's in the heart of the sea, but then he starts to realize it's not just that I'm sinking in the water. My sin has separated me from God. There's distance between me And my master, because of my sin, the captain had shaken him out of his physical sleep back during the storm on the boat. And now God is shaking him out of his spiritual slumber as he sinks in the water and his brain is screaming for oxygen and the panic is setting in. All of a sudden, he's recognizing he's not just about to die. He's going to die as a rebel, as one who is shaking his fist at God. This realization of what our sin actually is, the defiance of God, 
and the spiritual jeopardy that that puts us in, that is always the precursor to repentance. You and I have to realize that our sin separates us from God, and it means we are acting as his enemies. And that is a graver threat than any physical danger we could be in. Now Jonah feels as if he's being drawn down into the hungry mouth of the realm of the dead, a place of no return, a permanent watery grave. He says in verse 5, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. He recognizes that he's on a one-way road to death. And to be permanently, in his mind, imprisoned in the realm of the dead. And it shakes him. It shakes him. Previously, he thought he could run from God. He thought he could defy God. He tried to drown out the noise by taking a nap in the bottom of the boat. He didn't want to listen to his conscience. He didn't want God to speak to him anymore. He just wanted it all to go away. He had previously been defiant, saying, you know what? Throw me overboard. He could have said, turn the ship around and I'll go to Nineveh. That would have stopped the storm. But he says, I would rather die than obey God. And he thought that he was tough enough to handle that. But now as it gets darker and colder and deeper, he can't fool himself anymore. God has brought him to the break point. And he brings him to this break point and you see a great change taking place in the heart of Jonah. A change as he turns to God. I really believe that verse 4 is the break point. He says, I am driven away from your sight. He's at the end of his rope. But look at what he says. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. There's two ways to take this. One is as a statement of confidence that he's going to go back to Jerusalem someday, that he's going to make it. But I think he's referring rather to the act of prayer. He's saying, I've sunk this low, And my situation is this desperate, and I am separated from my God because of my sin, but I'm going to turn to him, and I'm going to call out to him for mercy, knowing that his prayers, even if he's at the bottom of the sea, will enter into the very throne room of God. We see him doing this in verse 2. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. It's interesting. That's the same word when Jonah was told by God to go and call out against Nineveh. And as the captain had told Jonah, call out to your God and ask him to save us. And he had refused. But now he finally calls out to God. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. He says in verse 4 that he's going to look upon his holy temple, that his heart is spiritually going to be oriented towards God and crying out for mercy. In verse 7, it says, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. You see, there's been a change that's taken place, and it's all happened in an instant. How long was he in the water? 30 seconds? A minute? How long can you hold your breath? And in that amount of time, God brings him to the break point, and he turns to God. He's no longer running from God. He's crying out to God. He's done a complete about face. And there's a bit of spiritual whiplash, as it were, as the orientation of his heart is abruptly reversed. And friends, this is at the heart of true biblical repentance. This is the first crucial step that we turn to God. This same idea is beautifully illustrated in the New Testament story of the prodigal son. In the Gospel of Luke, we see this same radical change in direction. The son who formerly wanted to get as far away from home as he could, who wanted to get as far away from his father and his father's authority as possible, when he's brought to the end of himself, when he gets to the end of his rope and he's eating pig slop or wishing he could eat the pig slop in the pig pen, he turns. He says, I need to face my father. It would be better to be back home. And he retraces his steps to return to his father, seeking to be in his father's house once again, to be under his father's authority, even in a greater degree than before. And though this is a painful process for the prodigal son, and a painful process for Jonah as well, in both cases, both of these men discovered that such repentance leads to an experience of mercy. And it's that way for you and me as well, for those who are distant from God because of sin. The scripture urges us in Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jonah knew that's who his God was. And so finally, as God brings him lovingly but severely to the breaking point, he turns to God. And he simply calls out for mercy. When you look at your life, when you look at your heart, the decisions that you make, the way that you think, the attitudes that you have, the motives in your life, are you a person who is turning from God in various ways? Or are you the kind of person who is turning to God? How you answer that question says everything about your heart. It says everything about where you stand today before God. A repentant heart seeks God. It seeks God in prayer. It seeks God in the word. It seeks God in the fellowship of other believers. No repentance is genuine or complete that lacks this desperate and wholehearted seeking of God, turning to him and calling out for mercy. Jonah's first step of repentance was turning to God and crying out for mercy. This is a muffled call for help. I don't think it was a very exquisite prayer that Jonah offered up in that moment. It's simply the frantic cry of a desperate sinner. And it's the beginnings of his repentance. But there's a second aspect of repentance we see in this psalm. So repentance is, first of all, turning to God. But secondly, repentance is evidenced by a submitted will. A will that is submitted to God. A knee that is bent under the authority of God. Repentance is evidenced in a submitted will. We talked last week about the conflict of wills in Jonah chapter 1. That's what led to the storm. God wanted this to happen. Jonah wanted this to happen. And they set themselves up as adversaries. And God's undefeated. He always wins those competitions. That's what had led to Jonah's distress in the depths of the sea, that his will was not submitted to God's. Jonah's sin was unique. You know, not all sins are exactly the same. Jonah's sin was not a sin of weakness where he wanted to do the right thing, and he was trying, but he failed. Jonah's sin was not a sin of being tricked or trapped. It's not that he had been deceived and taken in, like Eve was, perhaps, in the garden. Jonah's was not just a mistake. Jonah's sin was a sin of willful, hard-hearted rebellion. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he did it anyway. But God had gotten his attention. Jonah, in the belly of the fish now, finally bends the knee to the authority of God. We see this in verse 9. He says, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Like the sailors had already done in the ship, and like Jonah should have done, Jonah submits himself to God and vows his obedience He says, God, I will do what you're asking me to do. I am submitted to you. I am surrendered to you. I am no longer going to rebel and run. I will do what you're asking me to do. Jonah now could say, like the psalmist in Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. That's where Jonah's at now. Took a while for him to get there, but God has brought him to this place. And he is now finally submitting his will to God. There is no true repentance apart from submitting your will to God. If you continue in sin, if you continue your rebellion against God, this is the opposite of repentance. We submit to his will as it is it expressed in his commands in scripture. And we submit to God's will as it is expressed in God's purposes in life for his church, for the family, for us as individuals, his purposes for the world. The authority of Christ is not something we can ignore or something we can resist. It is something we must embrace. This is an essential aspect of true, biblical, genuine repentance, a will that is submitted to God. If you're a follower of Christ, then your call is to deny yourself and to follow Jesus. This is not just the ideal for what the, the super committed Christians are supposed to do. This is not just, you know, like the, the Eagle Scout Christians who are fully surrendered to God, who take up their cross and follow. No, Jesus 
goes so far as to say this in Luke 14. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's not a good way to get a really big church. Tell people, unless you bow the knee to Christ and his authority, you cannot be a Christian. You cannot be a disciple. You cannot be saved. You cannot live a life of ongoing rebellion against God and somehow benefit from his saving grace. Jesus comes preaching the gospel. He says, repent and believe. Does this sound like too much to you? Does it sound too much like losing yourself? To fully submit your will to God's? Is that asking too much? If it sounds like the death of yourself and the loss of your life, that's because that's exactly what it is. To bear your own cross, as Jesus says, is to embrace the death of self, especially the will of self. To announce to God that there is nothing off limits. There's no part of me that does not belong to Christ. Among all the things that were nailed to the cross, one of the most important things that's nailed there is our will, our autonomy. We lay that at the foot of the cross when we come to receive God's saving grace. The Puritan Thomas Brooks said this, Many hypocrites are willing to embrace a saving Christ, but they are not willing to embrace a ruling Christ, a commanding Christ. Thomas Brooks saw something going on in his day, and he called it out. And if he were here today, he'd probably say, we always will be dealing with this kind of a wrong approach to Christ. So let me ask you, is your will fully submitted to God? This is a necessary aspect of genuine repentance, and it means that you have a willingness and a desire to obey. And I want to make that clear. Sometimes we think that repentance means I'm really good at not sinning. That's not necessarily what it means. Repentance means that my will is submitted to God. I'm against my sin. I've turned from it and turned to God, and I desire to follow him. Repentance doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it means we've turned from our sin and turned to God, submitted our will to his. We're going in a new direction, and we are now at war with our sin. To paraphrase what Charles Spurgeon once says, that you cannot have peace with Christ if you still have peace with your sin. That's what repentance is. Doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you're all the way there. Doesn't mean you have it all figured out. But it means you've turned to God and you've submitted your will to his. That's what repentance is. But a third observation I want to bring out this morning. Third, repentance, true repentance, is ultimately a response to God's sovereign grace. It's a response to God's sovereign grace. And I love this. Think about it. Why did God rescue Jonah? Why? Was he the only prophet around? No. There were other prophets alive, even during Jonah's day. And God could have just kicked Jonah to the curb and said, fine, have your way. Go where you want. I'll get someone else to do the job. He could have let Jonah die in the ocean. Fine. You want to pick a fight with me, Jonah? You think you can run from me, Jonah? Let me teach you a lesson. Let me make an example out of you by sending you to your watery grave. Why did God rescue Jonah? It's grace. It's grace. God pursued him. That's what the storm is. God disciplined him. That's what it was when he was sinking in the water. And then God rescued him with this fish. God is the ultimate architect of Jonah's repentance. God is the ultimate spiritual chess master who's doing exactly what needs to happen to get Jonah right where he wants him so that he can bring about the change in Jonah's heart that God wants to see. And this is God's grace. Jonah doesn't deserve this. Jonah hasn't earned this, but God delights to do it out of his love and his grace. We can even see this as we look at Jonah's response in verse 9. We see his response of gratitude. He says, I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. He says, God, you've shown me grace that I don't deserve, and I am deeply thankful. We see it in his desire to worship. He says, I will sacrifice to you. This is not the sacrifice of atonement. Say, I will go to the temple and sacrifice an animal to cover these sins. This is the sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is a thank, a thank offering to express his gratitude to God. And we see it in his vow to obey. What I have vowed, I will pay. This is not a bargaining chip. He doesn't say, God, I'm going to obey you. And, and 
I will obey you if you save me. It's not, it's not, he's not bargaining with God. Sometimes people do that. You know, we talk about foxhole conversions. God, get me out of here. If you just do this for me, I'll do anything. You know, I'll give up this bad habit. I'll start going to church again. Maybe I'll donate some money or something. That's not what happened, what's happening here. God has already rescued Jonah. Jonah's not bargaining. He's responding to grace with gratitude. Jonah could sink no lower, metaphorically and literally. He'd gone down to Joppa, down into the ship, down into the heart of the sea. But Jonah sees what God has done. Jonah sees God's work of mercy and grace that God answered him. We see that in verse 2. He heard his voice, verse 3. And then we see this profound change in Jonah's experience. In verse 6. He says, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Everything's been down, down, down. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. That little word up captures the grace of God, that God lifted him. Like the psalmist says, you lifted my feet out of the miry clay and set my feet upon the rock. Jonah's saying, God, you already did this for me. Thank you. I will worship you. I will obey you. And Jonah declares This theological truth there at the end of verse 9. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation is, from beginning to end, a work of grace. When Jonah says that salvation belongs to the Lord, he means, first of all, that God has the power to save. He's able to. God can hurl the storm. He can appoint a fish. He can soften a rebel's heart. God is able to save. But it also means, secondly, that God has the desire to save. When he says, salvation belongs to the Lord, he's saying, my God is a God who desires to save, who is eager to save, and who does save. This desire to save is behind God's gracious discipline of Jonah. And Jonah sees it. He says, you can see it in verse 3, even though the sailors were the one who put hands on him and threw him overboard, he says, you cast me into the deep and into the heart of the seas. And the flood surrounded me. He says, all your waves and billows passed over me. God, Jonah rather sees what God was doing. He says, I get it. God, I get it. You were pursuing me. You were disciplining me to bring me back to yourself. That's part of God's saving work. Some of you here this morning might be miserable emotionally and spiritually. And you're miserable because God is convicting you of your sin. And that's the most loving thing God could do for you right now. Is make you feel the misery of your situation. This is God's grace to convict a sinner, but then to offer, as we celebrated this morning in communion, to offer the solution to our misery, the answer for our guilt, the hope for the judgment that we are facing, to offer us Christ, redemption and forgiveness. But we'll never need that. We'll never lay hold of that until we feel the depth of our need. And God in his grace is the one who initiates this work by convicting us and then drawing us lovingly to himself. And our repentance is a response to this grace. We see that in Jonah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's a saving God who pursues and disciplines, but then rescues and redeems those who are needy, those who are in danger of judgment and destruction. And here's what's amazing. You know, Jonah was a prophet of God. He had been tasked to speak for God. He knew the scriptures. Jonah was a good good theologian. So he knew that this was true before. He could have told you before all of this, salvation belongs to the Lord. But now Jonah has a story, doesn't he? Jonah has an experience. He's had this powerful encounter with the God who saves. So he can declare that salvation belongs to the Lord, not as a theorist, but as a witness who's testifying to his own profound experience. Jonah doesn't just know about this truth. He knows this truth. He's lived it. He's tasted it firsthand. And this is what compels him to obey his God, to express gratitude and worship to his God, to worship him. He's responding to God's grace. Grace is really the truest motive for all Christian worship and obedience. See that all throughout the scriptures, not just here. Go read Romans chapter 12, and you'll see that Paul exhorts us to offer a life of sacrifice to God. Why? Because of God's saving mercies that are laid out in chapters 1 through 11. 
We come to God with nothing to offer. We come to God not making any bargains. We are simply debtors to his mercy. We have been utterly dependent on him to save us. And he has. How can we not respond with a soft heart that's broken over our sin, eager to obey, eager to worship our Savior? We often think about repentance as being the path to experiencing God's grace. And in a sense, it is. But when we probe a little bit deeper, we will realize, I think, what Jonah realized, that even our initial act of repentance in turning to God is a response to grace that was already there. It's all grace from start to finish. If you're a Christian this morning, if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and have confessed your sin and trusted in his death and resurrection to save you, then then you and I, should be able to write a psalm like this because we too have a story. We all have a story and we should be filled with wonder and gratitude at the God who pursued us while we were still in our sin, who awakened us to our need and then brought us to the point where we broke and we called out for mercy and then graciously provided the rescue that we needed. In the New Testament, Jesus says that Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so also the Son of Man would be three days in the grave and rise again. We think of this fish as being an awesome miracle, and it is. One that saved Jonah's life. But an even greater miracle, the death and resurrection of Jesus, has provided rescue for you and me. Hopefully none of us will ever get swallowed by a fish. We don't need to. But every one of us needs the rescue that comes through Jesus. The one that ultimately this story points to and an even greater miracle. We, like Jonah, we who have experienced God's rescue, God's grace, we have every reason to sing. We have every reason to pray and express our gratitude. We have every reason in the universe to express eternal gratitude to God for his sovereign work of grace in our lives. As we'll see in the weeks to come as we get to chapter 3 and chapter 4, although this was, I believe, true and genuine repentance, In Jonah's life, it was not yet full and complete repentance. God isn't done with Jonah. These are great first steps. He's he's turned to God and he's submitted his will to God. But the issues in Jonah's heart that led to this disobedience in the first place, they haven't yet been fully dealt with. The fruit has been addressed, the fruit of disobedience, but God wants to pull Jonah's sin out by the roots. What that means is that this repentance needs to go even deeper. It needs to go all the way down to the depths of Jonah's heart. We'll get there in the weeks to come. But these are the first steps, the first steps of genuine and true repentance. And perhaps this is where some of us need to start today as well. Maybe you need to turn to God today and to submit your will to his and to receive and respond to his potentially painful work of grace in your life so that you can come to experience mercy. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And this salvation must be received by faith. It must be proclaimed to a world that needs to hear it. And it ought to be celebrated as we worship and express gratitude to our God. This remarkable story shows us that it's God's sovereign grace that brings about repentance in the hearts of his people. Despite Jonah's hard heart, despite every effort to run from God and drown out the noise of God's word and God's world, even to silence his conscience, God has relentlessly pursued him to discipline him and bring him back to himself. May we reflect on our own rescue story and declare with Jonah that truly salvation belongs to the Lord. Fathers, we read your word, we are humbled to see that even our response to you, our response of faith and repentance, is based on the grace that you've already shown us. Lord, we confess that we have nothing to bring to the table, nothing to offer you, no bargaining chips that mean anything. We are desperate sinners who are simply in need of your mercy. And you're the only one who can save. Salvation belongs to you and to no one else. Jesus, we believe that you are the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. We believe what Peter said in Acts, that there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we can be saved. Lord, we know that our own efforts can't save us. We know that 
the love of another person can never mend our souls. We know that true peace can never be found in a bottle or the pills we take or the pot that is smoked, whatever it may be. We know we can't fix our issues. You alone can save. God, those of us who have experienced your grace and your salvation, we thank you for showing mercy to helpless sinners like us who were floundering in the depths. And God, for those who may still be running from you today, who are trying to drown out the noise, Lord, use this message, this text, as part of your gracious pursuit of their heart. I pray that you would soften their heart and bring them in your kindness to repentance so that they can taste and see how good you are so that their sins can be forgiven, so their life can be restored, so they can be made new and made whole. Lord, for any believers who may be among us today who are resisting your will, I pray that you would bring us once again to a realization that we must submit to you, not just receiving you as Savior, but submitting to you as Lord. Be glorified, God, in this church. May we be a church that is quick to obey, that is ready to submit to anything you tell us to do, even the hard things, even the difficult things, the things that we may not initially want to do, we pray that you would help us to submit, that we would not be so foolish as to run from you any longer. So God, use your word to do your work and your people for your glory, and we pray it in your name. Amen.